Like Mandy said, my name is Jordan Arsenault, and uh, my wife and I are two of the founding members here at the South Suburban Vineyard Church. Um, I'm so excited to be speaking to you this morning, and I also want to recognize those who are visiting for the very first time. Welcome. I also want to address those who are uh, watching on Facebook and on YouTube through our iTunes podcast. And I want to say that you're more than welcome to visit with us here in Flossmoor if you're in the neighborhood. So uh, with a show of hands, who joined Threads this month? Does anyone know what Threads is? I know what you're thinking. Is this a sewing club that you've joined, Jordan? Um, have you taken up knitting? Um, no, actually, Threads is kind of the newest social media app, actually. Um, it's a social media platform launched by Meta, which is the parent company of Instagram and Facebook. And it's a text-based app that's similar to Twitter. In fact, some people are calling it the Twitter killer. Um, uh, See, uh, Twitter was bought by a very rich person um, uh, who made a lot of changes to it. And a lot of the frequent users of Twitter who are like journalists and prominent people, um, they don't like the changes that he's made to the platform and continues to make to the platform. And so there have been all of these um, text-based apps that are competing with Twitter. So there's Spoutable, there's Post, Blue Sky, uh, Mastodon, really funky names. Um, uh, and so they're trying to get people to switch from Twitter to this new one, Threads. And uh, on its first day, 10 million people signed up for Threads. And I just checked the thread count, which is what they're calling it, the thread count, and uh, we're now up to 119 million users of Threads. Um, what made it very easy to sign up was if you already had an Instagram account, you already had a Threads account. So I just kind of thought, why not? You know, I, I use social media to share my work. I work in television, I'm a producer, and so I often write articles, and so this is just another way for me to share my work with the public and then just kind of connect with people. But I also had an ulterior motive. And I'm ashamed to say it, but I wanted to get verified. <laughs> um, uh, so if you don't know what verification is, uh, verification on social media means that you get a little blue check mark <laughs> next to your name on whatever site you're using. And for years, that little blue check mark meant that you were who you said you were. Um, that the person who was posting on social media was the actual person uh, that was posting, and not some anonymous person. And, and the t social media company actually internally verified that you are who you say you were. Um, and so uh, it was nice to be verified, but also, you know, it kind of felt you, made you feel a little special, right? Like, so have you heard of the Dr. Seuss book, The Sneetches? Um, uh, there, there's the, the Sneetches basically have, some of them have stars and some of them don't. And so it's kind of nice to have a little star on your belly. And that's kind of what verification meant to me. Um, and so before, uh, Elon Musk, who's the owner of Twitter, took over. I tried a few times to get verified on Twitter. Um, I submitted articles that I'd written and my media, social, my media email address, and I could just never get past the red tape. And so I kind of give, had given up. It's, you know, it's not that big of a deal. But then they changed the rules. See, when Twitter changed, they said anybody can be verified if they pay $8 a month. And they took away the verification for all of the journalists and prominent people that already had verification unless you had a million followers or more. So verification went from you are who you say you are to I have eight bucks this month. <laughs> and so I really didn't want to pay to have a little blue check mark next to my name. And so I kind of thought that my dreams of being verified were gone until threads. So, the first day that the app launched, I thought, I wonder if in order to entice people to switch over from Twitter to threads, they'll open up verification for free. So I submitted three articles that I'd written in the past month and kind of went to bed. And the next morning, I woke up and I was verified. <laughs> 
I was verified on Instagram and threads. I was finally who I said I was. <laughs> I was finally somebody on social media. Uh, but truth be told, in all seriousness, uh, I've been very careful and intentional about what I post on social media for the last several years or so. And the reason for that is that long before I had that little blue check mark um, next to my social media handle, um, I had flown the, flown the flag of Jesus online and openly professed my faith to the public um, without hesitation. And I routinely and openly interact with Christian thought leaders and pastors and authors um, about subjects of faith and practice. And in doing so, I was wearing my faith on my sleeve. That, that is so much more important than some little blue check mark. Um, in fact, my twin brother, Jesse, who's sitting here today, uh, he and I compiled a distinct social media ethic on how we are supposed to represent ourselves online as Christians. And it sounds a little nerdy, but we created this 30-point document based on Scripture on our best understanding of Scripture. And it is taught us how to interact with people online. So I take this seriously. Um, and so like the Apostle Paul said, I, I have not achieved perfection yet in these things. I sometimes post things that I uh, am not proud of. I violate my own guidelines. Um, and so often I have to send things to Jesse to actually like edit it first to make sure that it, I'm being a bruv approach. But I press on towards that goal and I've got a long way to go with God's help. Uh, this is a tweet, if you want to put this up. This is a tweet from uh, Ed Stetzer, who is a pastor and author that he put up a couple of years ago. And it says, you'd be proud of the tweet I did not just send now. <laughs> to which I responded, uh, yeah, draft an iNotes, send to a friend for editing, um, and delete my social media life. That's typically how it goes. I come up with some witty, snarky comment. I send it to Jesse, and he says, that's, that's way too mean. You can't post that. You're a representative of Christ. You're supposed to imitate God in everything that you do. You can't write that. And so, yeah, ended up deleting. Not going to happen. Uh, you may be saying to yourself, why is this guy talking about his social media habits on Sunday morning? Who cares? Um, but I bring this up here because we're in the middle of a teaching series here at SSV that we're simply calling One Anothering. One anothering. And if you've spent any time here at this church, you know that in the summertime, we press pause and we focus on relationships. And since the phrase one anothering shows up, one another shows up dozens of times in the scriptures, and almost every time it relates to how we relate to one another as believers, um, we take the time to focus on that. So the scriptures have a high regard for how we love one another. And we forgive one another. And we build one another up. And a host of other one another's. Our relationships get at the two greatest commandments according to Jesus. The first being, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second being, love your neighbor as yourself. And so if you've been around here almost 14 years in November, if you've been around here, you've seen our slogan, love God, love people, live it out. And some of us even wear t-shirts that say love university because when you come to ssv you should know how to love people better and so we believe and take time every summer to talk about relationships because we believe that holy spirit fueled consideration for others is the defining characteristic of a believer in christ or at least it should be and it's the center of who we are when it comes to our faith our founding pastor, Gino, has taught on a variety of subjects in this series, from learning how to be more self-aware, to responding graciously when folks fall short of God's standards, to being risk-takers when it comes to Christian compassion. Today we're going to focus on a subject that I'm passionate about, that my twin brother and my wife, Nikki, that we majored in college, and Andrea too, we majored at in college, and that is mass communication. Mass communication. Um, and as someone who works in broadcasting, I'm sorry to say that the most common form of mass communication today is social media. 
It's not television. Um, according to Meta's official investor relations disclosure, close to three billion people log on to Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and WhatsApp every day. Earlier this month, Snapchat disclosed its daily users at 400 million people. And uh, Twitter actually disclosed its users at 237 million. So social media has become an ever-present part of our lives. And if it's ubiquitous in our lives, it's probably something Christians should be concerned about. It's probably something that we should know how to do well. But you might be saying to yourself, Jordan, I don't mess around with any of that nonsense. <laughs> See, I learned a long time ago that for my sanity's sake, I can't be on social media. Or you're like my mom, and you never even had a MySpace page. <laughs> yeah. I've entitled today's sermon, Love God, Love People Online. Love God, Love People Online. And what's great about this title is, even if you don't have a Facebook account, you can just chop off the online part. Because everything I'm going to be talking to you about today still applies to your own social networks, your coworkers, um, your friends and family, whether you interact with people on the phone or on the web, this talk will be helpful for you or anyone who wants to get better at one anothering. People you live around, people you work with, people you interact with. So today we're going to open up with a section of scripture where a Christian leader is addressing a younger Christian leader about how they can better interact with their fellow man in a way that honors Christ. And we're going to end with some practical advice on how to walk this out, a special trick that my brother Jesse and I have come up with in order to help us be better on social media. Um, but before I get started, I do want to say that this sermon is about addressing your own social media activity and is not an invitation to fix other people. So don't fix other people. <laughs> I totally understand the urge to police the social, social media activity of other people and uh, hold up the mirror of scripture to them. Some of us even have accountability partners, like my twin brother Jesse who we have invited to critique and correct us so that we don't post something weird online or say something stupid in general. Um, but for most people, um, particularly people who aren't Christians, um, it's better to kind of overlook those communication mistakes and maybe budget for kind of the off-color remarks. Um, so as you listen to today's message, pay attention to your own speech patterns and withhold your judgment towards others, unless they're someone that, that you, unless you're someone they trust to like give it to them straight. Um, and on a serious note, I also want to say that this sermon should not be an excuse for you to avoid conflict and play it safe when you're facing issues of injustice or like racism or like bigotry online. Um, we need to speak up when it's appropriate. Don't you think so? We need to speak up when it's appropriate. Like, my thinking on this like, comes from the Apostle Paul. Like, in Galatians chapter 2, Peter decides he doesn't want to eat with the Gentiles. And like, Paul like, addresses him to his face like, in public and says, like, we're Christians. We're not supposed to like, be judging people based on their ethnicity. You can't do that. And so I think that it's perfectly acceptable to do that if you do it in the right way. Um, Proverbs 31, 8, 9 says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. So we shouldn't be so cautious that it prevents us from speaking the truth when a forceful rebuke is appropriate. Though we should certainly be thoughtful and careful about the way that we do it. When you read discriminatory behavior on your feed from fellow believers in Jesus, you don't need to shrink back. I believe that people often need to be publicly corrected so others aren't deceived into thinking that it's okay for a Christian to talk like that. But before jumping in, like, as with anything, like, listen to the Holy Spirit. Like, 
see where he's leaning you and respond in a way that honors the Lord and honors people. And, and I would also say, like, don't go out searching for that stuff because you're going to find a lot of it. You'd be surprised. So today we're going to be looking at a passage of scripture from 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, feel free to follow along using your Bible app on your tablet or your phone. It's also going to be on the screens in, in back of me. And uh, we also have some analog Bibles in the room. If you want a paper version of the Bible, <laughs> you can do that as well. Um, uh, and we're going to look at the scriptures. And, and obviously, they didn't have social media back then. So we're, we're going to try to extract some wisdom from, from Paul's instruction to Timothy. Here. Um, uh, but before we do that, let me pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Uh, Father, I thank you that your word is truth. Um, I thank you, Father, that even though this was all written in the first century, uh, there's so much wisdom that we can extract from it in our daily social lives. I know social media is something that the Apostle Paul probably <laughs> never envisioned. Um, but I thank you, Lord, that your word is truth and it's the foundation of truth. And so we have to look to it first for your guidance. So, I, Father, I just ask that you would open people's ears to hear, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would put some Holy Spirit power on my words today. Um, and I pray, Father, that no one would feel condemned um, leaving today, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would, they would feel convicted, Father, maybe to think more about their social media patterns and their speech patterns in general. And so I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture from 2 Timothy chapter 2. And uh, this is a selection from a pastoral letter from Paul to Timothy, who was a young second-generation pastor in Ephesus. And this is kind of Paul's um, swan song. This is his last letter before he dies, as, 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 as much as we know. He may have written many letters, but this is the last one that we have. And so this is some final instruction to Timothy to be bold in his faith, to be faithful, obedient, blameless. And in chapter 2, the beginning of chapter 2, he's talking to Timothy and he's asking, telling him to be a good soldier for Christ. And then we get to this section here um, uh, where he focuses on how he can use the best use of his time as a young leader in the church. And so we're going to start in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Paul says this, Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. This kind of talk spreads like cancer, as in the case of Hymenaeus and Philetus. They have left the path of truth, claiming that the resurrection of the dead has already occurred. In this way, they have turned some people away from the faith. But God's truth stands firm like a foundation stone with this inscription, The Lord knows those who are his, and all who belong to the Lord must turn away from evil. In a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones are used for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean, and you will be ready for the master to use for every good work. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. Amen. I mean, there's a lot more we can go, but this is kind of the section that I want to focus on. And there are several points that I want to pull out of this passage as we learn to love God and love people online. And the first bit of wisdom that I see here is it sounds like from Paul's instruction to Timothy, that God's approval is greater than man's approval. 
You know, God's approval is greater than man's approval. Rereading verse 15. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. You know, I think the entire point of social media at the beginning, you know, maybe in the my state, MySpace stage, the Friendster stage, uh, was to kind of share our experiences with other people on social media. Um, like my wife and I, we, on our, for our anniversary, we just went on um, a little trip, and it was really cool sharing our pictures and what we ate and the places that we saw with our friends and family. And I feel like if social media was limited to like vacation memories, it would probably be a better place. Um, uh, but uh, the problem is, is it's not limited to that. And I think the issue is oversharing. Um, we don't have time to focus on this issue today, but uh, there's this issue of comparison with people. And the sheer mass of things that we share on social media can often make us think that the green, grass is greener on the other side. Uh, not only do we share benign stuff like what we ate for breakfast, um, but we often share our political opinions and why the political opinions of everyone else is wrong. Uh, we share our newest outfits, and we downvote the outfits of other people. Um, we give high reviews for our favorite businesses, and we try to cancel the businesses in our Facebook groups where we have really bad experiences. Um, we degrade famous people and politicians, and then we gossip about people very close to us. And after all of that, we're rewarded with the approval or disapproval of friends and followers with reactions. Um, you know, thumbs up, hearts, laughing emojis, uh, uh, the surprise, the angry. And, you know, there's this addictive quality to receiving positive reactions and supportive comments, and we feed off those responses, right? We're kind of checking minute by minute to see if somebody has seen what we've posted. You know, that, that's bad enough. But where this can make an even worse turn is if all of those reactions and those comments, if those mean more to us than God's approval, right? Um, years ago, I preached a uh, sermon called, Would Jesus Follow You? <laughs> and uh, what I meant by follow is like in the social media sense, like would Jesus follow you? Um, uh, if Jesus were on Twitter or Facebook or TikTok or Instagram, would he follow you back? Would Jesus retweet the last thing that you posted about? Uh, would Jesus react with a heart to the latest photo that you uploaded? Or would he quickly unsubscribe from your page because he doesn't want to see any of that? Um, Paul says to Timothy, and we can assume that this applies to us as well, that we need to work hard to present ourselves to God and receive his approval. And if our work is good, then we have nothing to be ashamed of. So it's not that our friends and our family and our coworkers and our acquaintances, it's not that they're not important. It's just that God needs to be our primary judge. Paul talks about this thinking in this famous passage from Romans 12. He says, uh, So dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. And uh, I, I, to me, the logic follows that if we're to give our bodies to God, that our social media platform probably belongs to him too. Uh, God's opinion of how we represent ourselves in the virtual world matters just as much as the way we represent ourselves in the physical one. So some good questions to ask if you're on social media is, would the Lord like this? Does Jesus get any glory from my unproven theories about what's going on in the news? Uh, when I'm in a contentious thread, um, does God get any glory from the way I'm responding to people? Um, am I telling half-truths in what I'm writing? After all, Jesus is known as the way, the truth, and the life. It's probably important to be truthful. It doesn't really matter how many positive reactions from other people we get, because what really counts 
is what pleases God. And if you can't discern that in the moment, you probably shouldn't post what you want to post. Um, if you're acting like a fool on social media, you're often making following Jesus look foolish, too. Shallow, immature stuff is probably something we should stay away from on our Facebook page. If we're to glean any wisdom from Paul's writing, and we're going to go next to verse 16. Avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. This kind of talk spreads like cancer, as in the case of Hymenaeus and Philetus. They have left the path of truth, claiming that the resurrection of the dead has already occurred. In this way, they have turned some people away from the faith. The second bit of wisdom that I think we can extract from Paul's advice to Timothy that applies to social media is to avoid worthless talk. Right? Avoid worthless talk. And Paul describes this talk as worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. On Twitter, I call this the hot take. Do you guys know what a hot take is? Um, a hot take is basically the quickest opinion you can have about whatever's going on in the media. In fact, some people have hot takes based on like a headline. Like they can't, they don't want to buy like per, the article, they don't want to pay the dollar to read the article, so they just read the headline and then they spit out an opinion about it. Um, I love this verse in Proverbs. This is the New Living Translation. Proverbs 18.13. Spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. <laughs> on Twitter, you have about 280 characters to work with in your tweet. Now, if you pay the eight bucks a month, you get, a little, you get some more. Um, uh, but what we often write amounts to being worthless, in my opinion. It isn't valuable. It isn't wise. And it only leads to more cheap and foolish responses from people we're conversing with. So two people that Paul mentions here, Hymenaeus and Philetus, their worthless talk that Paul cites was based on flimsy theories about the resurrection, and it led many people away from Jesus. So this is something that we need to keep in mind when we have that urge to share something that isn't entirely based on facts. You know, what kind of collateral damage are we causing by spreading unfounded conspiracies and hoaxes? You know, I actually don't think there's anything wrong with questioning the official narrative when it comes to things happening in the news. As a trained journalist, I know that I have to have a healthy amount of skepticism, especially like from the government and from official sources. And like institutions, they can be corruptible, right? They're just like humans, we can all be corruptible. And so you have to be scrupulous. But you don't have to post about it. You do not have to post about it. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a saying in journalism that we, that we learned in college, and it's, um, yeah, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> yeah. So the idea is, is that you just can't take things at face value. You kind of have to do some interview, interviews, maybe, with your mom, because <laughs> if she loves you. Uh, you might need some literary attribution, maybe some cards to back it up. You might need two or three more witnesses. Um, um, so we shouldn't be posting stuff based on our best guesses, right? Um, Proverbs 10, 19 uh, says this, Too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. The words of the godly are sterling silver, and the heart of a fool is worthless. The words of the godly encourage many, but fools are destroyed by their lack of common sense. Um, I, I have a very low bar when it comes to like sources that I post. And uh, the low bar is this. If a sixth grade English teacher won't accept it on a works cited page, I don't reference it. So that kind of eliminates a lot of YouTube <laughs> videos and uh, kind of strange websites. Um, uh, that, uh, that you might post about. If you don't have proximity knowledge about a specific subject, then you don't have a fully formed opinion um, that's good enough to share, in my opinion. Why lead others down a path of paranoia and despair when we could be encouraging people with our precious words? Paul says that paranoia and despair spreads like a cancer, like in the case of Hymenaeus and Philetus. 
he mentions these two clowns. Um, and in the online world, I call that going viral, right? That's kind of like the way, you know, I know from personal experience, this is the way cancer works. My daughter had leukemia and it, uh, she had blood cancer and it spread throughout her entire body. And I can see how like rumors and things, it just spread very quickly. And I think we should go viral, but we should go viral for speaking the truth, not for speaking half-truth. That's what we should go viral for. So Paul, coincidentally, he upholds this in the next part of the passage. He says, verse 19, But God's truth stands firm like a foundation stone with this inscription, The Lord knows those who are his, and all who belong to the Lord must turn away from evil. So the third piece of wisdom I want to pick out from this passage is that God's word is truth. God's word is truth. God's word is the yardstick by which we should measure all other forms of information. If what we're tweeting and posting about online is shown through the lens of God's truth, then we're much more likely to avoid potential trouble. The Lord, our true friend, not our social network fan friend, <laughs> will be much more likely to like our posts if they're rooted in his words rather than foolish things. That sometimes God can use his glory for and what, it, it determines our usefulness, right? If God can use us, it determines our usefulness. In the next part of this passage, Paul uses the analogy of cutlery to show how not being careful about our behavior can change the prestige of our witness. He says in Verse 20, in a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones are for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean, and you will be ready for the master to use for every good work. So this gets at the fourth piece of wisdom I think we can point out, and it's our desire on social media to be a special utensil. Be a special utensil. If I'm writing foolish stuff online, Jesus can't really use me in the way he intended. So I want to be careful about what I post. And I want to keep myself pure on the inside because that's only going to be reflected on the outside on social media. If you have a young person next to you, I want you to ask them what IRL stands for. Yeah. Cam, what does IRL stand for? In real life. In real life. <laughs> in real life. Um, this is an acronym. It's, a, it's, it's a internet speak um, for in real life. And it's a way of saying um, what you do in your daily routine. So maybe on, you know, maybe on, uh, uh, you know, Twitch or, or uh, Discord or something like that, you say, like, I'm a really good gamer. Right? But in real life, I'm a producer at ABC7 in Chicago. That would be what I would write. Um, uh, and uh, people use this because uh, in real life is your normal life. But online, it's not your real life. Right? It doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't count. And I think a lot of us approach social media that way. That it's not real life. It's just a game. Um, in, in November, I made a really bad mistake. Um, uh, on Thanksgiving, I played football with the SSB men in the morning. And that was a mistake because Mark Roberson and I collided and I hit my chest and it was a $400 uh, ER visit for me. <laughs> um, but it was perfectly acceptable in that game for us to collide and no hard feelings because it was in the context of the game. You can tackle people in football, and it's perfectly acceptable. But if I came home from Thanksgiving, and I just started to tack, decided to tackle a family member at the Thanksgiving table, that would not be acceptable. Because that's not part of the game. Here's the truth. Social media activity is not a game. It's real life. It's really happening. It's all real, and it matters. And this stuff truly affects our witness. Ed Stetzer, who I mentioned at the beginning of this message, wrote a book a few years ago called Christians in the Age of Outrage. Uh, and he details in this book how, how Christians have been acting a fool on social media. And he contrasts that with how the Bible says that we should behave. 
Uh, he says, the outrage of the culture overwhelms the truth of the moment, and when it does, it hurts our witness. He goes on to say that when outraged Christians look foolish, that hurts the gospel. It adds to the perception that Christians are rage-addicted snowflakes, and more important, distracts Christians from their mission. So what's our mission? Apart from loving God and loving people and live it out, you know, what's our mission? Well, our mission is Matthew 28, right? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. A good question to ask yourself is, is it possible my social media activity would make it harder for somebody to come to Christ? What we post is a reflection of what's happening on the inside. All you have to do is open up the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' most famous sermon, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And you can see that our thought life matters just as much to Jesus as our actions. Being of pure mind and heart is just as important as being pure in our bodies. And so this begs the question, how do you keep yourself pure? Well, Paul answers that in the next part of this passage when he tells us to run. He says, 2 Timothy 2, uh, verse 22, Run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. So this is the fifth and final piece of wisdom I think we can take in terms of our social media activity. And that's what we should run from bad influences and run towards good. Run from the bad and run towards the good. Anytime a spiritual authority like Paul is telling you to sprint away from something, that's probably good advice to follow. This is timeless wisdom. What does the Bible say? Depart from evil, right? Resist the devil. Flee fornication. Run towards the eternal rather than the temporary. In 1 John 2 it says, Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see and pride in our achievements and possessions. These things are not from the Father, but are from this world. So another good question to ask is, is there anything on social media that I should unfollow? Whatever those things that you might struggle with, personally, it's wise advice to run away from it. Uh, maybe it's a celebrity crush that kind of consumes your thought life. Maybe it's movies or TV that are obscene and raunchy. Uh, for some people, it might be like really divisive political voices that kind of fill you with paranoia and fear. Maybe it's TikTok, the social media app designed to keep you engaged with endless reels of doom scrolling and takes your eyes off like what's happening like right in front of you. You know, whatever you struggle with, Paul's advice is to run away from it and run towards righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Instead of pursuing unhealthy friendships, we need to pursue godly companionship with folks who fear the Lord and live wisely. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5 that God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. We need to be peacemakers. And we need to follow fellow peacemakers in the online world where rage and divisiveness rule the day. Amen? Amen. Paul says this in verse 23 and 24, that we should not get involved in foolish, <laughs> ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. I really feel like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Zipzorp and Blabbermouth, whatever new social media app there is, <laughs> I really feel like it should be a better place because followers of Jesus are on it. That's just my opinion. Uh, there should be less fighting in our circles. There should be more kindness, more mercy, and more grace when we get into contentious arguments. I want to close today with just a laundry list of verses. 
um, that have really helped uh, my brother Jesse and I love God and love people online. It's a lot of verses, but these are verses that are special to us, and it's stuff that we keep in mind because we want to represent ourselves and represent Christ the best on the internet. And worship team, you guys can come up. Uh, the first verse is this, 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. What's the wisdom here? We are Christ's ambassadors. Colossians 3.17. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. We are Christ's representatives. Ephesians 5.1. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Imitate God. Psalm 9, 7 through 9. But the Lord reigns forever, executing judgment from his throne. He will judge the world with justice and rule the nations with fairness. The Lord is a shelter for the oppressed and a refuge in times of trouble. If I'm to imitate God in everything I do, and God is a fair judge um, with, with a special care for the less fortunate, I feel like I need to do that too. Uh, Philippians 2.5. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And in this passage, he's sp talking specifically about Christ's sacrificial attitude, laying down his life for others. John 13, 35. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. The leading edge of who we are in Christ has to be love. It can't be our political opinions or whatever. It has to be love. James 1, 26. If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself, and your religion is worthless. Um, our ability to speak wisely on social media affects our witness, and people pay attention. Oh, that guy he said he was a Christian, and he's treating people like, like he's being a jerk on social media? Your religion is worthless. Um, uh, Matthew twenty two sixteen. These are actually the enemies of Jesus talking here. They sent some of their disciples along with the supporters of Herod to meet with him. They said, Teacher, we know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. You are impartial and don't play favorites. This tells me that I need to endeavor to be seen as honest and impartial, even by people who would oppose me. Um... This is Paul talking in Philippians chapter 1, verse 15. It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, and they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. This teaches us that we need to inspect our motives when we're posting on social media. A Titus 1, 6. This is a quickie. An elder must live a blameless life. If you're going to be a leader in Christian community, you have to endeavor to live a blameless life. And finally, this is God talking through the prophet Isaiah. The high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one says this, I live in the high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. We need to have a vision of God, holy and on his throne. And that should humble us to know that we don't have all the answers on everything. So with all those verses in mind, Jesse and I have created this statement that we post before anything that we say on social media that's of any consequence. So we copy and paste this statement before we write anything, and then we delete it if what we want to say passes muster. And this is how it goes. And this is probably hard to read. <laughs> As an ambassador for Christ, representing Jesus to the world, imitating God in everything I do, judging situations in fairness with special concern for the less fortunate, having the same sacrificial attitude as the Messiah, knowing that the leading edge of who I am is supposed to be love, 
realizing the value of my commitment in Christ is tied to how wisely I use my words, endeavoring to be regarded as honest and impartial even by those who would oppose me, inspecting to see if my motives are pure, leading by example because more is expected of me as an influencer in Christian community, and seeing the Lord in his rightful place on the throne of my life while acknowledging that I don't have all the answers, I think this. Insert comment here. Insert photo here. Insert video reel here. We created this a few years ago, and I have to say that this practice has gotten us out of so many situations where we would have embarrassed ourselves and our witness. Now, not everything is going to be this consequential, right? Like, if you think the Bears are going to win the Super Bowl next year, I don't think you have to post that. I mean, that's a controversial opinion, <laughs> but it's not a consequential one. But if, if you're going to say anything of consequence, I feel like you have to be able to say all of that before you post it. And that filters out a lot of foolishness. Is it possible your social media activity would make it harder for someone to come to Christ? Does your Facebook wall look like a barrier instead of an invitation? Does the demeanor of your life describe a moral political view over a grace-filled appeal to life in Christ? Are you reflecting what Jesus called the church to be? Salt and light. Are you loving God and loving people well online? God is calling us to live our virtual lives in the holy and acceptable way, in the same way that we live our physical lives. He's calling us to behave in a way that shows our love for him and our love for others. So let's pray to the Lord to help us as we walk this out this week. Let me pray. Come Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you that you never stop working, um, that you convict us um, even, even after worship, Lord, and, and in the message, you convict us to be better people. And I thank you that you expect us to be better people when we le leave here on Sunday mornings. And so, God, I pray, Lord, that there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, Lord, that people wouldn't feel judged, but that they would feel a leaning to be more careful about what they're broadcasting out there, Lord. And I start with myself, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would just... Give me the wisdom and strength, Father, to not be haphazard in the way that I post things, Lord. And I pray, Father, that our witness at the South Suburban Vineyard Church would be a good one online. I pray, Father, that uh, no one would be able to look at one of our posts and say, uh, that person is a judgmental jerk. I pray, Father, that our church would be known as the Freeze Pop Church at the parade who loves people and loves God with all their hearts. I pray, Father, that they would see this place as a hospital for the hurting, for people on their journey with Christ. And I just lift everyone up in this room to you, Father. I pray for your Holy Spirit to help us, God. It's really hard to do this on your own. I pray, Father, that we would have Holy Spirit-fueled consideration for what we write online, what we post, the videos we share. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.